Uh, first, I'd like to share a couple passages with you. One comes from Acts 24, verse 24. Several days later, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and listened to him on the subject of faith in Christ Jesus. Now, as he spoke about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became afraid and replied, leave for now, or in the ESV, go away. (laughs) But when I have an opportunity, I'll call for you. So that's neat. We get a window into what Paul would talk about, what topics he addressed when he had a very quick opportunity to speak with a dignitary about the gospel. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And even after a faithful gospel presentation, Paul was told, go away. Two chapters later, in Acts 26, verse 24, Paul, in this story, is in front of Agrippa and Festus. As he was saying these things, as Paul was saying these things, in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You are out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters, and I can speak boldly about them, boldly to him. For I am convinced that none of these things has escaped his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, Are you going to persuade me to be a Christian? My translation here says, So easily, or ESV, in such a short time. Paul replied, I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. Now, I had read that by myself earlier in the ESV. What does it say in yours? In such a short time or a long time? Whether short or long. Rather short or long. Another neat window into Paul's mindset of using opportunities that are short or long to share the gospel. We also see Paul again in front of a dignitary uh, with a beseeching Uh, an urging, a persuasive urging. What a neat window into Paul's own evangelistic ministry. Let's review some of what we've covered so far. Evangelism is, strictly speaking, verbally communicating the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the call to repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins and for the receiving of eternal life. But if we zoom out just a little bit, we can speak a little bit loosely, perhaps, of the category of evangelism as also including the kind of communication we engage in with the near and immediate goal of sharing the gospel. Does that make sense? So there's the strict definition of evangelism. And you might use a, a, a definition that is a bit more broad just to speak about the going out and engaging in the kinds of conversations where you have the immediate goal of sharing the gospel. There were two main types of evangelism I categorized. Do you remember them? Stranger Stranger and relational relational evangelism. The first being more direct, perhaps urgent, speaking with someone that you likely will never see again. The second, someone you're speaking with someone and you know that you will have recurring interaction with them. What are some conversational questions I've encouraged for your evangelism thus far? Tell me more about yourself. yourself. What are some other uh, questions I've asked? 
I've, I've uh, advised to ask in your evangelism. How's your weekend? How's your weekend? Uh, Has anyone shared the gospel? Have you ever heard the gospel explained before by a born again Christian or evangelical? Have you ever heard a summary of the gospel before? Or you might say, um, what's your understanding of the gospel? And if someone says they've never heard it, you can ask, may I explain it? It's a really simple formula for getting into conversation, or at least in the conversation, getting to a place where you can summarize the gospel. If they say they have heard it or they do know it, you can invite them to summarize it for themselves, upon which you can build your conversation. I'd like to ask also, what do you think are some of the biggest differences between what you believe and what Christianity teaches. So if somebody, by their own confession, is not a Christian, I like to ask, in your understanding, what are the biggest differences between your worldview and the Christian worldview? I also advised developing personal terminology for greeting others that is especially warm and familial to other believers. So scripture teaches us to greet other believers with the holy kiss, to greet the friends, we can at least obey this in as much as we learn to, in a warm way, excitedly receive believers that we come to meet. I love doing this on the street. You meet a believer who's from out of town, they're there for an event, you get to know a little bit about them, and it's a spiritual discipline even to train your heart to be especially excited to meet a believer and to train your words to express that. And then also to develop a way of greeting uh, unbelievers or strangers that is hospitable and kind. Jesus spoke about the importance of not excluding our greetings to just our brothers or our friends. I also advised learning to ask open-ended questions that can be potentially reciprocated. Questions, you can ask a hundred of these, or just a handful of these, and if it goes nowhere, then fine. But often, someone you're asking open-ended questions, at some point, will ask, what about you? (laughs) And that can uh, put you down a path of an evangelistic conversation. I'd like to share a few stories, in part to encourage you, in part because I was reviewing these um, and uh, they, they were on my heart. But I think they'll be encouraging to you, and I think they might help us put us in a good mood to talk about evangelism. This, so just a note about evangelism and journaling. It's just tremendously helpful to write down your encounters, to debrief with your friends, to think about who you could pray for, and to look back and see what God has done in your life and in the life of you should life of others you've shared the gospel with. I've had uh, entries where I've talked to someone and then I met them again as a quote-unquote stranger a year later and um, I literally like something pop up pops up like I talked to Anton like a year earlier I I, I just totally forgot who he was and the description I have of him the second time is completely (laughs) similar to the first. June 24th 2012, I tried doing some evangelism using a whiteboard on an easel. This is in a very large uh, group context where you have people flooding a public domain street. It did not work out so well. The wind was blowing and people were not interested. So I went to my normal tracting, handing out tracts, and I got into a conversation with an older Mormon lady. Long story short, some Mormon teenagers gathered around to listen. Someone got the whiteboard back out for me. That was my friend John. And I was able to use it as a visual. An hour later, it had evolved into a very large crowd. So most of my night was street preaching about the temple, about grace, and about the nature of God. It's quite the setting, too, because I was right in front of a Mormon temple talking about the New Testament teachings on the temple. At the end of the night, a Palestinian Muslim... Yes, a Palestinian Muslim in rural Mormon Utah approached me. He was a foreign exchange student. 
He heard me preaching to Mormons that God was never a sinful mortal. And we talked about the nature of God and the Trinity. Muhammad asked about the cross. Why would God humiliate and shame his own son? Because he loves us, because God has shown us sacrificial, sacrificial love. There is something very, quote unquote, foolish and beautiful about the God who became a man, who died for us. It was doubly great because a group of LDS teenagers silently stood around me and Muhammad and listened. This was quite the spectacle for them. And then later, a Christian named David, who had a lot of experience witnessing the Muslims, came over and joined us. When we left for the night, walking to Miller's, a restaurant, we happened to intersect Muhammad again. Muhammad, good to see you again. He was wandering because he could not find his American host family among the thousands of sitting Mormons in front of the pageant, which was basically a musical. So God apparently wanted us to talk to him some more. So I bought him a soda, and we talked for another 20 minutes. A kind Christian in Miller's got in his truck, drove back to his tent to get a modern English Bible for him, which he had asked for and brought back for him. The reason we didn't have one to give him is because we, at the time, were all using King James Bibles because Mormons, we thought, respected it more. We talked about final judgment and grace and also about Muhammad himself in Palestine, which I know very little about. Later that night, he emailed me with a link to the Quran, which he wanted me to read. Then, the lit next day, at Subway, I ran into Daniel. Shame on me, I did not recognize him. But he recognized me and said, Aaron, Daniel is a young fundamentalist Mormon from a polygamist family who I have spoken of before. I often think of him, especially when we once had a conversation at Miller's, that's the restaurant, across a booth. We exchanged contact info and agreed to hang out sometime. He said that tonight and tomorrow he's going to look for me on the streets of Manti so we can talk. Tears in my eyes right now. It's so amazing. I just show up and God does amazing things. It's so awesome to be here with my friends. Alex, as I've mentioned before, just came back from his two-year LDS mission. So he was just a Mormon missionary. And he just had come back in August and he became a Christian. And he was on the streets that June sharing his faith with us to his own people. June 10th, 2016. This is two years later, or, or four years later. A very simple gospel presentation to John, a homeless guy who camped out near us for a bit. He told us his story. We walked through creation, the fall, and the coming of Jesus. Simple gospel conversation. Quote, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Luke does international accounting for the LDS Church. We've seen him a few times since he works at the nearby office building. He's a friendly guy. We talked about whether it mattered, whether God was ever a sinner, whether God was the first of all the gods, and whether we can be worshipped ourselves in the future. So I shared Isaiah 43.10, Before me no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. Then I spoke to Chris, who is a Mormon from Illinois. Chris served his two-year mission in Spokane. He said he had never, never to his memory, ever had a memorable or meaningful conversation with an evangelical Christian before. People had typically shut the door on him. Now he is an LDS business college student. We talked about God. Revelation 4 verse 8, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He left as Nigel arrived and interrupted. We've talked with Nigel in the past. Nigel, Nigel has been a classic, angry, arrogant, secular skeptic, ranting against the Bible and mocking God. Today, he was calm and different. It was interesting coming back to the same place every week because we got to talk to some of the same people um, again and again. Today, he was calm and different. He says he had an experience of the supernatural in his home and has been opening up to new possibilities. I don't know what that experience was. 
At one point, we talked about our sense of justice. I compared the Stanford sexual assault case, must have been something going on in the news. The judge, the criminal, and the father of the criminal all seemed to think that six months of prison was more than enough for sexual assault. I said, that's what we're like with our own sin. We think that God's threats of judgment for our decades and decades of heart-corrupting, conscience-denying sin are overkill. We think six months is more than enough, but it isn't. At one point I said, our sins in private are worse than the public sins of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Now, if you're talking with an angry liberal skeptic and you really want to get him going. (laughs) He replied aghast in his Johannesburg South African accent. Certainly not. (laughs) But yes, really, we deserve judgment. Everything good we receive is by grace. Even tomorrow's morning, even tomorrow morning's cereal. He replied, I certainly do not share your point of view. He said he'd continue. He'd return and continue our chat. (coughs) Then I talked with a Polynesian young man who goes to Hillcrest High School in Midvale. His arms were bigger than my legs. <laughs> he was waiting for his father to stop talking with Paul. Paul Stoddart was an uh, exuberant, uh, friendly, and cheerful, and uh, energizer bunny uh, evangelist <laughs> who uh, was a delight. So I think his father was talking to Paul. After learning more a bit, learning a bit about him, I abruptly asked him if he could see himself believing in Jesus outside of Mormonism. So there was no natural segue to this. I learned more about him, and I just asked him a point-blank question. I explained to him that Jesus was the most compelling person who had ever lived, and that New Testament Christianity does not pivot on epiphanies of good feelings or visionary experiences. It pivots on the eyewitness testimonies of the bodily resurrected Jesus Christ. Last story, July 19th, 2019. I went to Temple Square last night. I worked with believers from Payson Bible Church. It's like 40 minutes south. Gospel Grace, five minutes away. And the Mission Church, where I was at, about 20 minutes south and a visiting team from Minnesota. Shared the gospel with a young Muslim man. Where are you from? New York. What's your religious background? Muslim. Have you ever heard a Christian explain the gospel before? Nope. May I? How long is it going to take? A minute or two? He then attentively listened about the omnipotent God who became a baby, who was executed to be a curse for us, who rose bodily from the dead and was installed as the king of all, someday again to receive those, some, to return again to receive those who believe in him. He listened and he took a tract. Then I shared the gospel with some in town for the Young Living Essential Oils Conference. Anybody know? <laughs> some of whom reciprocated with a spiritualized pitch for oils. <laughs> It's like I share the gospel with them, and they're like, well, we have good news as well. (laughs) That stuff gets super spiritualized for some people. (laughs) No judgment. Sorry if I'm... Um, Spoke at length with Layman, a passionate Mormon who was upset that I was unwilling to count him as a fellow Christian. He was also upset that we were handing out tracts to Mormons. He prided himself in not being like other Mormons. I'm not like those Mormons. We talked about whether the LDS Church treated ordinances as mere outward obedient expressions of grace already received, or whether it teaches that they are necessary events or bringing first-time remission of sins, for example. We talked about whether he can know that God has a God, or whether God has a grandfather God. I used strong language regarding idolatry, and he was taken back by it. 
His wife waited in a vehicle nearby. I remember this at the northeast uh, corner of the temple. His wife, SUV maybe, she drove up next to the sidewalk. She was like... (laughs) (laughs) He kept walking away, flustered. Then he would walk right back and keep talking. I urged him to repent, and he was taken back by that saying that I was judgmental even to say such a thing. In the end, we shook hands and agreed to have breakfast sometime soon. I told him that might give us a context for having a calmer conversation. And we both apologized if our tone went beyond what was appropriate. Then I walked up to a beautiful site of believers I had mentioned earlier were all together, having prayed, singing in Christ alone. These are really sweet memories. I remember Layman, we, uh, he gave me his business card, and we ended up having breakfast uh, a while later. And he brought me to a really ritzy hotel uh, breakfast restaurant, and he paid for it, and he was a really wealthy businessman, and it felt really awkward to me. And I just came up with, you know, my programming street clothes, you know, just like tech t-shirt, and, he, and I was able to share more with him over breakfast. Um, it's nice. You know, there's different contexts for different modes of communication. Last week, I mentioned a rubric for conversational evangelism, a list of six modes of communication to grow in. It comes in three pairs. Listening, questioning, asking questions, sharing, declaring, and uh, I think I have correcting and encouraging. Just modes of communication. Today we'll talk about, for a bit, listening and asking questions. We Christians have a lot to say. I love to monologue. I I have to fight not to monologue. We are messengers with good news. But we have plenty of reasons to be strategically quiet. I want to give you 10, largely from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 17, 27. By default, these are coming from the book of Proverbs. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. So restraint shows wisdom. Number two, patient listening is contrary to a quick temper. 1429, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. And do you all remember a verse from the book of James? Really? Famous verse, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, great for parenting and great for self-reflection on parenting. Number three, patient listening helps slow a conversation down to reduce unnecessary quarreling or tension. Second Timothy 2.24, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Number four, it is shameful to hastily speak. Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Number five, you are less likely to act foolishly if you keep your cool. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, Proverbs says, 14, 17. And a man of evil devices is hated. Number six, patience is persuasive. This is Proverbs 25, 15. With patience, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue may break a bone. Seven, restraining your words means you will have less to regret. Proverbs 21, 23. 
Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Number eight. It is prudent to let some things slide. Proverbs 12, 16. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. So, a great evangelistic skill, ignoring insults. Or, listening to five horrific blasphemies and heresies and just awful factual inaccuracies and not jumping on every one of them. Just picking a path to go down and letting a ton of things slide so that you can focus on one thing. Number nine, listening helps you ponder how to answer. Sometimes you hear people say, you're only listening so you could think about what you could say next. Well, I don't think that's typically the problem we have. I think the problem is we're not even thinking about what we're going to say next. Proverbs 15, 28 is, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked... Pours out evil things. Lastly, number 10. You can silently pray for someone even as you are actively listening to them. Have you ever done that before? But Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. It is completely reasonable and appropriate in a very difficult conversation. As you're actively listening and processing what someone has to say to simultaneously Subvocally, pray in your mind, Father, please bless this person I'm speaking to. Please give me wisdom and patience. Please soften this person's heart. Next, six reasons to ask curious and probative questions. Number one, there's pleasure in understanding. Proverbs 18.2, a fool takes no pleasure <clears throat> in understanding but only in expressing his opinion. Number two, this is a great evangelism proverb. Proverbs 25, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So it's good to draw out the purpose in a man's heart. Number three, Asking questions is a natural expression of warmth and hospitality. We're told in the New Testament, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And to be hospitable is a virtue expected of anyone qualified to be an elder. So at least it's a model virtue. And it seems natural and obvious to me that when you're hospitable to someone, say in your living room, You sit down, they're over for dinner. What do you do? You ask them questions about themselves. Number four, as I said last week, people are interesting. They are royal image bearers of God. C.S. Lewis says, you have never met a mere mortal. Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Number five, People are not, people are sometimes not what they pretend to be. Proverbs 13, 7, one pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Someone who claims to be a Christian may not understand the gospel. They may not even go to church or read their Bible, or anything. So you just can't take someone's self-expressed identity at face value. Asking diagnostic questions about their background, about their life, their walk with God, their understanding of the gospel, is a kind way to scratch beneath the surface. We met plenty of people in Utah who claimed to be Mormons, And they would, if you ran with that, would defend Mormon doctrine. They would be culturally defensive of of their heritage, their background, their people. 
But 30 minutes later, you would learn they don't believe a lick of it. They don't believe it. That's not what makes them tick. That's, and it was such a waste of time. We could have gone straight to their heart, to their conscience, to their actual beliefs, to their actual unbelief. We could have spent more time talking about the gospel more directly. Number six, one may be grieving beneath a courteous affability. Proverbs 14, 13. Even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. So someone's demeanor might be perhaps just them, uh, their way of being courteous. They're just holding themselves together. And you start asking them questions, and oh my goodness, they're going through something terrible. We met people on the street who were in the midst of divorce proceedings or child custody uh, conflicts. Or um, God had been, these strange situations where God, I felt like God wanted me to come here tonight to learn more about him, in which they're thinking, going to the temple, you know? <laughs> and we're like, well. <laughs> Another list for you. This one's on reasons why you might consider restating someone else's position or restating their argument. So this is a way of slowing the conversation down. It's a way to show you're listening. It's a way to ask good questions. But in particular, it's a way to take what someone has said to you and couch it in your own words, even in a strong form. It's called steel manning, perhaps so that they know you're listening to them and you, and you have something to work with. So I might say something like, would you, let me put that in my own words and you tell me if I heard you correctly. Is what you're saying, it's different from you saying, so what you're really saying is, it's, it's more like, is, so let me, under, let me see if I understand. And then you try to summarize what they say it helps, a, okay, I'll give you a list. This is a long list, but it's brief. There's not a lot of scriptures that are attached to these. <clears throat> Number one, it shows that you are listening. Number two, translating it into your own words requires a basic understanding of what they said. Number three, attempting to translate something can identify its meaninglessness. Does that make sense? My friend Bill McKeever once said, if it can't be translated, it probably doesn't mean anything. So someone might just be talking. Someone might just be re reactionary or reflexively or thoughtlessly using words that they don't even understand the meaning of. And you, in your respect, restating what they've said in your own words, you might be helping expose for them the meaninglessness of what they've just said. Number four, hearing someone's own position translated helps them understand their own position. I don't merely want you to understand my position. I want you to understand your position. Number five, it slows things down. You haven't shot back or merely reacted. This, is, this reduces tension. It makes for a sustainable conversational rhythm. Number six, your translation of their argument or position can strip it of needless rhetorical flourish. So sometimes people say awful things couched in the most beautiful of verbiage. And when you respectfully restate it in your own words, in a kind of concise and pointed way, it doesn't sound so good anymore. And they need to hear that. Number seven, positions or, or arguments can sound ridiculous when they are clearly summarized. Simply restating someone's position can remove the need to refute it. Get it? Sometimes simply restating what they say reduces the probability of quarreling or needless conflict because they just simply heard it out loud and they go, oh, that doesn't, mm, that doesn't sound like it holds. Number eight, it earns you 
credibility from which to state your own position. Now, I do not buy the notion that in order for me to say anything important, I have to earn uh, the right to say something. I, I, there's that, that line of thinking uh, can be abused to uh, saying I exclusively have to be relational in my evangelism and earn social capital before I say something. So I, I reject that line of thinking because I'm quite, I, I think, stranger evangelism where I have zero capital <laughs> or even the relational evangelism where I've lost all capital, right? I still have authority before Christ. It's not even my authority. It's just restating what Christ's words say on the, on the basis of his authority. But that said, there's a kind of social capital in the moment where someone's more willing to listen to you because you've shown them your willingness to listen. Number nine, can help you identify common ground upon which to build. I have to qualify that one. I actually don't think believers have any deep common ground with unbelievers ultimately. But there's a kind of conversational common ground where we find topics that we can build on. Number 10, you might make a friend. There's, there is a sweet friendship that you can build with unbelievers. I mean, how many people have you met in your life who take the time to say, huh, so let me, let me, let me understand what you're saying. And you take the effort to restate what you say in their own words. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, this dialogue where you're actually talking about truth in a substantive way. It's like, man, you meet somebody who actually likes to talk about ideas and the big ideals of life and truth. And you can't help but just enjoy talking about those kinds of things with a neighbor or stranger or coworker. It has formed for me, I mean, many people pit stranger evangelism with relational evangelism. Oh, doing this has made me so many friends that are very unlike me. Very, 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 very unlike me. Number 10, number 11, it dignifies and honors their words as meaningful. Number 12, it dignifies the very act of communication and of dialogue. Now, I mean, you realize how uh, cynical the world is about words. This is just meaningless uh, news speak. This is just empty rhetoric. Uh, all they can think about is politics and how politicians will just say things to get a reaction or to win something or manipulate you. And for them to meet someone who cares about meaning expresses your love for truth. There's an optimism built into that, that truth matters and that knowing the truth is possible and enjoyable. And so when you meet someone and you dignify the meaning of words, not just react to what they say, but really respond to the meaning of what they say. It really honors truth and in turn, Jesus Christ. Uh, I think I bled over into 13. It combats cynicism that all such communication be, can be reduced to sophistry or stimulus or grandstanding. Number 14, it honors another as a thinking soul, a royal reflective, rational, introspective human being made in the image of God. We're not dogs. We're not Pavlov's dogs. And think about all the psychological theories out there that think about our behavior merely in terms of reaction and response and chemicals. We're not dogs. God made us to be image bearers. Number 15, we would want others to do the same to us. This fulfills neighbor love. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And yes, I have two more. Sorry, long list. 16, provides an opportunity to overlook and redirect poor communication. Good skill in conversational evangelism is redirection. Sometimes people say, 
foolish things. And it's best not to engage them. You probably think about this in marriage or friendship or like a, a small group setting where someone says something and you're like, oh. and you it just graciously bring it down to a different topic. We'll address that later. Or, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to shame you or dishonor you. We're going to, it graciously seasons the conversation with salt. And lastly, 17, it may provide a, another with a better way to restate their own position elsewhere. It is a gift of clearer articulation. This is a grace. So some tips for today. This is a bit of a summary at this part. Patiently listening and asking good questions can extend the life of a conversation and give you more opportunity to share gospel truth. Another tip. This one's simple. It's just body language. Dudes have a way of squaring up, you know, with their shoulders that I think to the common person on the street can be uh, intimidating or aggressive. And we don't even think about it sometimes. So it's helpful to have, you know, some proximity and then just to angle. That's, it's real simple. Just angle. <laughs> Guys need to hear this much. <laughs> just come at an angle. You're not squaring up. You know, there, I've... I've um, it's part of the youthful immaturity of worldly, fleshly approaches to evangelism. Um, you, you hear like a teenager after an evangelism encounter, like, how did it go? How did it go? And they say, oh, I really got him. <laughs> you know, it's like, totally, you know, refuted what he said. And it was just, well, it's just like, you know, it's like there's, there's a godly pleasure and, you know, godly refutation, but there's a kind of like boxing uh, mentality that we ought not we ought not treat as a primary metaphor, right? Because there is a spiritual warfare in this. There is refutation that happens at times, but it's not the primary metaphor for evangelism. This is a mental trick I use. I have to fight hard to listen and ask questions. I told my wife this morning I might be the last person in the world they should be listening to on listening um, because I get excited. I'm an easily excitable person. That might be why God bent me toward evangelism to overflow with these things. But I have to work really hard not to monologue. So I think in my mind about the image of a baton. And so what I'll do is I'll take the baton in my hand and I'll talk and then I'll, you know, in my mind, hand it to the person. And so I don't, I don't talk again until I have visualized them handing the baton back to me. We had a policy in our group evangelism activities in Utah uh, in a cheeky way. It was called fry your own fish. It was the fry your own fish rule. And the idea was if you were on the street and you walked up to an existing conversation, let's say, you, let's say uh, Noah's here talking to three different Muslims, and I just walk up, and I'm eager, I'm excited, I want to get in there. And I hear some of these guys say factually inaccurate things that, oh, I have a good answer for them. And I want to get in there as quick as I can. The problem, though, is I'm probably not thinking about the path that Noah is slowly going down. So he might be in a mode of listening and patiently asking questions and getting to a central key gospel truth. And it's helpful for me to hear beforehand, uh, do not interrupt an existing conversation uh, unless you're invited. Don't, uh, just at least be very, I mean, don't, we weren't absolutists about this. Um, it, in fact, if we had new, fresh, green evangelists who came and joined us, they would interrupt our conversations all the time, and we would just learn, you know what, God's in control, it's not the end of the world, um, salvation is not ultimately dependent on how polished we are as a group. And praise God for new people who come and, and fumble and stumble all over themselves because we know that God loves to show his wisdom through our weakness and our foolishness. His power is shown in our, through our weakness some miraculous way. So we were, tried to be very gracious about it. But we would afterwards say, hey, just a reminder, fry your own fish. You know, don't interrupt existing conversations. Square up. <laughs> don't square up. Don't square up. 